We presented some data that we collected on a retrospective study of patients um, and data was collected from 13 um, academic centers as well as the core CLL database. Um, and we were able to identify 25 patients who had uh, received venetoclax in a prior line of therapy and then were retreated with venetoclax as a, as a later line of therapy. Now, the motivation behind this study really is that venetoclax-based regimen are now standard of care in the frontline setting based on the CLL14 data and then in the relapse refractory setting based on the Murano data. Both of these schedules are fixed duration. Um, and so as these um, regimens are inc increasingly used in clinical practice, a question that is going to face uh, physicians is, you know, what, uh, can, what therapies can patients um, receive after venetoclax? And say you have a patient who uh, received a fixed duration venetoclax therapy, for example, um, venetoclax obinutuzumab um, in the frontline setting and had a, had a good response to therapy, but then later on progresses is it an acceptable treatment option to use a venetoclax-based therapy again in a later line of therapy? So this is an important unanswered question. Um, there were a couple of cases before, um, you know, we started this project in the literature. We were able to identify 25 patients who were retreated with venetoclax. Um, the reason for discontinuation of the first line of venetoclax therapy varied from completion of planned therapy um, to discontinuation for toxicity, a very small number of patients cost, and then some um, MD patient preference. Um, and we were able to collect um, response rates to the first line of venetoclax therapy. The response rate was quite high. Um, uh, reaching in the high 80% range. And then we looked at um, patients who received venetoclax again. Patients who received venetoclax again um, were heavily pretreated. So median prior number of therapies was two and notably 60% of patients had prior BTK therapy. Um, and reason, the most common reason for retreatment was CLL progression. And we found um, that we had 18 patients who had um, a valuable response assessments at the time of data cutoff. Um, and we found a very high overall response rate of 72.2%, um, which suggests that this strategy should be investigated and that needs to be validated prospectively um, but that retreatment might be a viable option for these patients. Um, one of the interesting uh, things we were also able to collect is safety data of this strategy. So there's, because this, there's little data on this, we don't know, you know, do our clinicians who are doing this in, in clinical practice, there's no, no uh, really label to guide this per se, do they do the traditional venetoclax dose ramp up or, um, do they um, restart at, at, you know, dose of 400 milligrams? So most people, the overwhelming majority of clinicians did do the standard um, dose escalation ramp up and TLS was very uh, rare. There was laboratory TLS only, um, only in 4.5% of patients. And so it was reassuring to see that a little bit of safety data that this was also a safe strategy. Um, so I think, you know, overall, um, and then there was another uh, abstract at this uh, ASH meeting um, to touch on um, related uh, follow-up of the Murano study um, that also looked at patients who had been treated with venetoclax and rituximab um, on the Murano study and needed subsequent therapies. Um, they did identify um, the same number of evaluable patients as our abstract, uh, 18 patients, and they had the same overall response rate of 72.2% to venetoclax retreatment. So now we have a little bit more data in the space. Um, venetoclax retreatment certainly needs to be uh, prospectively validated, um, but I think that this uh, data we presented along with the data from the uh, Murano follow-up um, offers um, a window that this strategy should be uh, further investigated.